morning, everyone. Um, the problem with uh, comprehensive spending reviews, of course, is that they contain a sea of numbers, and if you're not very careful, you start drowning in them. So we've taken uh, most of the last um, 20 hours or so trying to work our way through these numbers, and Matt's going to be going into some of the detail uh, later on. But I'm going to start by looking at some of the headline numbers and picking up some of the points that uh, Sally made. Um, the first question, I think, for taxpayers is, has this spending review actually delivered what was promised back in the June budget? And I think overall the answer to that is yes. There has been a small increase, or a small reduction, in the total cuts from 83 billion in the final year down to 81 billion to increase capital spending beyond what was allowed for in the June budget. But by and large, the, the cuts have been delivered. Um, what has changed, I think, is, and this has been widely discussed already, is that we've had a switch away from cuts in departmental spending limits and towards greater cuts on the welfare side. And if we just look at some of the, uh, the numbers here, just headline numbers, I'm not going to do too many. Um, departmental expend, uh, spending limits are now set to fall by 10% in real terms by the end of the period compared to this year. Um, the bulk of that cut, of course, comprises the near 30% cut in capital spending. Um, current spending in the limits falls by about 7.5%. So there are definitely cuts there, and as we know, there are some very significant cuts in some individual departments. But overall, 7.5% is a little bit less than people were, were expecting, I think. Um, on the welfare side, despite all of the measures that have been announced, all of the capping, all of the various other things that have been uh, rolled out, and uh, all the heat that has obviously generated, uh, actually, when you look at it in real terms, um, the bit of spending um, that, that contains welfare is roughly unchanged in real terms between the start of the period and the end of the period. So he's had to pedal very, very hard just to keep that, that down. Um, now, I think what, what I'm going to look at now uh, is the key thing that Sajid mentioned that is driving this. Why do we have to go through all this pain? We've talked about this before. We talked about it in our budget briefing in the summer. But I think it's just worth emphasizing the point again. Because, of course, there's one element of the entire budget that it continues to grow very, very rapidly. And let's just look at that now by putting up a slide. This is public sector debt interest payments. It's a slide we've used before. And the forecast for that has not been changed by the Comprehensive uh, Spending Review. And as we can see, although uh, Mr. Osborne has managed to cut the debt interest uh, that we're going to pay by a, by a certain amount, it's about three billion in the final year of this, uh, this period, um, it's still shooting up alarmingly. And as we move through the forecast period, it starts to grow above even what we're spending on education this year. So it's a very serious burden, and it basically means that uh, the Chancellor, whoever the Chancellor is, has to do something about other spending just to contain the overall budget, contain this kind of growth within the, the, the uh, spending caps that uh, were implied by the need to get a grip on our fiscal situation. So this is constantly eating up more and more of the budget as we go through the period. And there are various ways of looking at this and, and trying to get across just how significant this is. The following chart shows one way that we've done it before, Jen. Um, this is debt interest cost per household. Uh, the same figure, the Osborne projection as we move through the, the period, compared against the interest on the average mortgage that a, that a British family has. So as we can see, as we move through the period, on a per family basis, the debt interest actually rises, that we're paying on behalf of the government, actually pushes through the debt interest that a typical family is paying on its mortgage. And so, you know, the second mortgage is becoming more and more, uh, more and more of a burden for the average family in this country. Now, the thing about this is that we all know about debt interest. You know, um, Mr. Osborne talked about it a lot in his, uh, in his budget, and he, talk, he mentioned it again yesterday. We know about the fact that this is rising, and of course it could rise a lot more if we lost the conf confidence of the guild market. That's a very important point to remember as well. But this debt interest, and this is coming back to a point that Sajid mentioned, 
you know, there, are, there is a national debt that we have that yesterday rose by another 16 billion. The official national debt is now just below 1 trillion pounds. And then there are other elements of debt that have been given quite a lot of publicity, um, like the unfunded public sector pensions, like PFI, and like our unfunded state pension liabilities as well. And if you add <coughs> all of those together, you start looking at a much, much bigger, what we would call real national debt figure. And we actually produced a paper on this earlier in, this, earlier in the week. So it, to, to, to a large extent, this picture on debt interest, formal debt interest, actually understates the true burden that is unfolding before us with these other commitments that we've made. So what we've done here, if we move on to the next slide, Jen, is bottom line again is the formal debt interest that we've already looked at, moving up through the forecast period. On the top line here, what we've got is a line that includes these other elements. It includes state pensions, it importantly includes these unfunded public sector pensions, <coughs> it includes PFI. And in a sense, this is closer to the cost of servicing what we recognize <coughs> as the real national debt. And as you can see, by the end of the period, we're looking at a take out of total spending, or a claim on government revenue, if you like, of nearly 200 billion a year to, to fund these things. And that puts any chancellor under a huge squeeze in terms of how he's actually going to keep the overall spending totals down while still managing to fund this. Now, we can have a discussion later about what we could do about this, but those are the current facts of the matter. Does that include basic state pension? It does, yeah. It includes basic, what, what it does is it includes the basic state pension and the second SERPs and the second state pension figures. These are DWP figures that have been included in here. Um, so what proportion of that green line is the basic state pension SERPs? And if, you, if you add those three together, it's about half of it. Roughly. Um, so, that, that's the situation, that is the increasing burden, that is a major problem that any Chancellor has to deal with. And at that point, I will stop and hand over to the next speaker.